Hello and welcome to Sports Talk, The Generation Gap, episode 12. Let's meet the family. Starting from oldest to youngest, we have my dad, Bob, Charlie, myself, Bobby, Benny, and Nick. So, college football week one is in the books. It was a pretty exciting uh, weekend. Some pretty wild stuff happened. Uh, probably what stands out to me the most, uh, the Colorado TCU game uh, was absolutely wild. Uh, Coach Primetime and his Colorado Buffaloes went into Fort Worth, Texas, upset the number 17 ranked TCU Horn Frogs um, in a, in a completely revamped roster. Um, he's got his son playing quarterback who had over 500 yards passing, broke a Colorado record. Uh, his other son led the league or led the uh, team in tackles. Um, and then they have his other kid uh, playing offense and defense. Um, so Colorado's looking like it's going to be a, a real exciting team. Uh, Clemson got upset in major fashion by Duke last night, got absolutely steamrolled. So where's Clemson in uh, the general scheme of things? I, I believe all of us picked Clemson to at least make it to the ACC title game. So that's not looking too good right now. Um, and then obviously more news about realignment coming out. We had the, you know, ACC picking up, uh, three schools, SMU is going to be joining, uh, two more schools, uh, from the PAC 12 will be heading that way. Uh, so that continues to be, uh, an ever changing landscape, but, uh, just week one reactions in general. Um, uh, Nick, was there anything that really jumped out to you? Yeah. I mean, I think it's Colorado for sure. Um, and maybe, maybe coach, coach prime rather. Um, I think, you know, you think about Colorado as a program, it, it was this Colorado Buffaloes or was this Deion Sanders? I think, <laughs> you know, there's so much talk about, you know, the transfer portal and how that affects player movement. Um, but maybe what we hadn't thought about is how this impacts, you know, coaches as their own, I guess, franchises, if you will. Um, how they can be, you know, independent players who can then, you know, go wherever, whatever G1 program they want, kind of set up shop and then create the team they want. Um, Colorado this year had like 48 incoming transfers, which was 19 more than Arizona State um, at 29, the second most. So, you know, again, is this, you can pretty much disregard, you know, Colorado's, the Buffaloes as a program. This was, <laughs> one individual coming in, kind of creating his version of the team, you know, bringing in some some talent from that he had at Jackson State, um, and going in and beating TCU. Um, now TCU may be a bit overrated, um, but I think the concept of you know a single coach just going in, basically creating a team from scratch, it's pretty wild. Um, I think, you know personalities, I guess big coach personalities or, or strong recruiters. Um, maybe this model is going to be kind of a new thing. Um, but yeah, Colorado, I think that was super interesting. Yeah, that was absolutely crazy. Um, I mean, going from a one-win team last year to all of a sudden, I mean, now they're ranked 22nd. The AP poll just came out. They're ranked all of a sudden. Uh, and can you imagine what the atmosphere is going to be for a game against Oregon and USC if, if they kind of keep rolling like this? I mean, they're going to be playing Nebraska next. Uh, Nebraska could get steamrolled. Uh, or maybe this was just a crazy fluke. We'll, we'll see. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, it's going to be team fun. Is going to the, the Big 12. It kind of fit in right away. Uh, a lot of, yeah, lot that's of, right. They're getting that pre-Big 12 but, matchup. This, yeah, this exactly. But uh, – so, Charlie, uh, going over to you, your alma mater, Northwestern, uh, had a pretty rough day, uh, which I guess is not all all that surprising considering, uh, you know, the tumultuous offseason they had. Uh, but uh, what were your takeaways from week one? So the Wildcats played on Sunday, which gave me the opportunity to watch them since they weren't really competing with uh, much else on the sports calendar. Uh, they lost 24 to seven to Rutgers. They looked pretty feeble um, in that effort. They only gained, I think, 201 yards in the game. Um, 
but I, I feel like almost the, the hazing situation has uh, maybe overshadowed just how weak that program had become anyway. So Northwestern had lost 21 of their previous 25 games. And um, since Fitzgerald was fired, the only lost one returning player to the transfer portal. So essentially the team that played on Sunday was the same team that would have played had Pat Fitzgerald been there anyway. So I think um, in my own view, um, Fitzgerald's demise might've only been a year or two down the road anyway. I mean, they were, they were a, had become a bad program that was potentially trending even worse. It'll be interesting this year to see if they can win any games. Their, their two best opportunities are coming up. They've got UTEP at home uh, this Saturday. Uh, UTEP's a one and a half point favorite at Evanston, Illinois. That's pretty sad. And then I think uh, two or three weeks down the road, they've got a game against Howard. But uh, anyway, it, it was, uh, we're all noticing the situation because of what happened with the hazing, but this program was really, really tanking. Uh, as it was. It'll be interesting to see what happens to the next few years they've got. They're slated to build a new stadium. Um, uh, and that's that's kind of controversial in their local uh, Evanston community anyway. But anyway, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of uh, a lot of negative vibes around that, that program currently. The other thing I wanted to mention is on Saturday, I went to the, the beginning of the Luke Fickle era at Camp Randall Stadium. It was the hottest game in Badger history. Uh, the temperature, I think, reached 93 degrees that day. Um, and I would say overall, the Badgers uh, didn't quite live up to expectations. Um, Fickle, I mean, I, I have no doubt that Fickle's been a great coach and he's a great hire. Uh, he also embraces hype. And uh, this coaching staff, I mean, they, they do not lower expectations one bit. All right. And they really had uh, they've had the fans really fired up for this season and for this opener. And I think fans were ready to see a track meet and ready to see a lot of vertical passing. And that's not what we end up seeing. We end up seeing um, a pretty, a pretty strong ground game. The Badgers rushed for about 300 yards. They looked statistically like a Badger, a, a Badger team of years past. Um, they didn't look dominant whatsoever. I think there, there's, a few question marks as the season goes on, maybe especially on the defensive line. All that said, from a very personal point of view, um, and maybe part of this was just the heat, but my God, did that game take a long time? The game lasted, it was three hours and 35 minutes, and it felt like twice that. And I know there's there's been one change instituted in college football this year, Um whereby there's, uh, they're not stopping the clock after first downs, I think, in, until like the last two or two and a half minutes of each half. So that was in an effort to speed up games. Um, my understanding is that two weeks in, uh, game duration is not less than what it was a year ago, but the number of plays is down, maybe as much as like 10 plays per game. I know uh, Chip Kelly, the UCLA coach, uh, he really went off about it in his, in his post-game press conference, basically saying that, there's fewer game, fewer plays, but more commercials. And I got to say, anecdotally, that sure is what it felt like. It was brutal. So anyway, I hope, you know, uh, game attendance has been in a decline for a while, and there's a lot of factors, but game duration is certainly one of them. And boy, the, the NFL certainly does a way better job than college football does. I think the, the NFL game duration is about, it's close to 20 minutes less. Uh, part of that comes with a shortened halftime. It's about eight minutes shorter, but I don't know. There's a lot of stuff going on in college football that that I think makes the, the game day experience, um, I don't know, sometimes it's hard to get through. It certainly was on Saturday. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, it's something we're really going to have to monitor because, uh, yeah, I mean, these games are already crazy long. So, um, and yeah. Real interesting thing about yeah Northwestern too, and kind of yeah their demise over the last few years. I mean, I, if I'm not mistaken, they won the Big Ten West twice. Yeah, not not too long ago. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, and, and then they, they tanked. Yeah, so yeah, maybe some of this stuff behind the scenes has something to do with all that. <laughs> right. But, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, pretty wild how yeah it was just total collapse. 
So, uh, Benny, I noticed uh, looking at scores that uh, your alma mater, the St. John's Johnny's, had a major rally against Trinity uh, School from Texas in the Division Three world. Um, but uh, what did you, what did you take away from this weekend of college football action? Well, you know, Bobby, uh, a lot of people get hyped up about D1 football, but, you know, who cares? Really, it's about <laughs> D3. <laughs> and uh, for everyone listening, if you're not watching D3, you will be after you hear me speak. But um, St. John's beat uh, Trinity uh, in overtime. Now they are ranked number four in the nation. So, um, you know, I-, I can feel that this might be the year that St. John's brings home another national championship. Um, you know, honestly, the team's looking so good that, you know, Deion, San- Deion Sanders is probably lucky that St. John's isn't in D1 because if they were, Colorado might have a, a big road bump there. But anyway, luckily, they're in D3. Um, fun fact, though, about St. John's football. <laughs> um, really funny, but it still goes on. I just checked from my college days, but they do not make cuts on the St. John's football team. So any person that shows up that wants to play in the same <laughs> football team can. In fact, right now, just briefly looking at the roster, I saw they have 13 quarterbacks. 13. <laughs> so, you know, though I never played for the team, it's not because I couldn't. It's because I just chose not to. You know, I just uh, priorities, I guess. But uh, I could have I could have perhaps led them to a national championship in a past life. Um, but. Yeah, so uh, fun fact there, pretty interesting. Um, in other college football news, yeah, I mean, seeing Clemson uh, lose to Duke is hilarious. You know, I remember the days, and I've seen Kansas beat Duke in college football. Um, so not sure what's happening there with Clemson, but putting up only seven points in your first game of the season after finishing uh, with, I think, 13 wins last year, not good. But uh, it's always fun to see some of these juggernauts start to fail after a while. Um, things have to change. You can't stay at top for on the top forever. And hopefully we continue to see more uh, sort of turnover in terms of who's dominating college football. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, Clemson has, I think lost maybe three of the last four games um, kind of dating back to, to last year. Um, so they kind of be, it seems like something's going on there. They, they have not really, uh, dipped into the transfer portal as much as some other teams. Uh, so maybe they're starting to notice that you know, maybe that's not going to be the best strategy moving forward. We'll see. Or maybe just the Davos Swinney area is, is just kind of ending. I don't know. But um, so, Dad, we're still a couple weeks away from Ivy League starting. But uh, was there anything that you noticed over the weekend that uh, stood out to you? Uh, yeah, using my powers of clairvoyance, since uh, being on the other side of the world, uh, I didn't actually watch any. Um, I can uh, throw out a little bit of information, for example, about how to keep track of, uh, of what's going on. Since all of you were either physically present or sitting in front of a television, or in Bobby's case, sitting in front probably of four or five screens watching uh, uh, football unfold, uh, you wouldn't have had the... Uh, occasion or need to investigate alternative means of uh, uh, tracking football. But there is, uh, there's something out there called the Varsity app. Um, and it, uh, of course, it, it works better for somebody from my generation uh, who as a kid was used to not being able to watch actually football games on TV, except it'd be, you know, it'd be a Saturday college football game on. Um, and then uh, you'd get to wait till the next week and see who turned up on the uh, the game of the week uh but uh, the varsity app is a radio connection and uh, a large number a large number far from all uh of the ncaa division one and some two and three schools uh can be found on the varsity app their, their radio broadcasts uh so uh where i was in uh, in tashkent you know all i had to do was uh, anticipate that 10 or 11 hour time difference, depending on the venue of the game and uh, hit the varsity app, look up a team's broadcast and listen away. So I caught, for example, the uh, uh, Minnesota Nebraska game and pieces of uh, uh, other games as I chose uh, their bits of uh, Notre Dame and Michigan and so on and so forth. Uh, I could have uh, uh, found my way to a lot of 
a lot of different games. I, I suppose I, I could have done it uh, by seeking out all the uh, Dartmouth grad transfers playing around the NCAA. I saw a list uh, just yesterday. There are like 13 guys. <laughs> 13 different uh, NCAA schools uh, this fall. I think all but one are grad uh, transfer. One of them just was a transfer. Uh, but uh, uh, including uh, one who played for Colorado, uh, a guy named uh, uh, Shane Cox, who was uh, elected uh, as a uh, Colorado's equivalent of a captain. Colorado doesn't use the word captain. They use leaders. Um, and the other is that actually two leaders. They're either leaders or dogs. Uh, and uh, there, Colorado has four of them. And one of them is a Dartmouth grad transfer um, who played on defense for Colorado and it was a wild high scoring game. So I'm not sure what that means. Uh, <laughs> but it was uh, it was nevertheless it was nevertheless uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty interesting. Um, for the uh, let me a couple of comments. First off, uh, I'm always a little skeptical about games that take place on or about the first of September or maybe the thirty first of August or, or whatnot. Um, you're going to get a lot of interesting results, and a lot of teams are really not quite ready to play that uh, that early in the season. So you've got to discount just a little bit. Uh, in terms of uh, the results. Uh, Ivy League football uh, starts in two more weeks. And so they were having scrimmages against themselves this uh, this past weekend just for uh, for practice. Um, and, and speaking of which, and Charlie's better positioned to comment on this than I am, but if, if a team in the Ivy League suddenly started having uh, dramatically different results, um, I would immediately start my mind would immediately go to the admissions office <laughs> and uh, okay wait a minute has has there been a silently instituted crackdown um because i know that's happened at various places from time to time it depends on the presidential administration and who's running the admissions office i know about yeah. 30 years ago uh, there was a mild scandal at dartmouth when somebody leaked a uh, a letter uh, that had been published by the dean of the of the college who was saying some very, very disparaging things about football. And it was didn't take much to put two and two together to figure out that somebody had put the squeeze on uh, admissions uh, in, uh, in football. Uh, so Northwestern, more than any other Big Ten school, might be affected by a, a syndrome like that, where suddenly um, someone in the academic hierarchy or perhaps at the top is a little uncomfortable if they're too successful because it doesn't <laughs> feel right. So... Uh, <laughs> Oh, so things like that bear watching uh, based on, uh, on on my experience. Um, uh, so uh, after, I'll just toss out my uh, freebie uh, acclaim for the, uh, the, the varsity app, uh, which is a great way to track college football wherever the heck uh, you might be. All right. Great plug for the varsity app. Feel free to sponsor us. Uh, always looking for great partners out there. But, uh, yeah, it was a fun first week. Uh, my Minnesota Golden Gophers found a way to squeak by Nebraska. Wasn't a real impressive showing by either team, real defensive battle. Our defense absolutely won us the game. And uh, hopefully we'll get get the offense figured out. But, uh, yeah, fun, fun first week. We'll see how things uh, go from here. But, uh, Charlie, you want to take us through drinks? Sure. Let's start with the young guy. Nick, what do you have going tonight? Um, so I'm kind of getting over a cold right now, so I'm going with a uh, a non-alcoholic option. Well, you can see it now. This is O'Doul's with a kava concentrate. I think I've, I've displayed kava on this show before. It's Polynesian extract. Very mellowing. Without some of the, um, I guess physical detrimental qualities alcohol can show sometimes. Um, it's tasty. It's a Cavarita flavor. So kind of tastes like an arm palmer. Does the Cava actually bring its own flavor? Yes. I think it's um commercially they, they try to mask it as much as possible. It probably um I don't kind of soil you using for your grass, but it's probably kind of like that. 
if you were to taste that. So it's not tasty. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, let's uh let's clatten the age ladder, Ben. Talking to me, Charlie? You're the person named Ben. Okay. I wasn't sure. It was so subtle and quiet that I wasn't quite <laughs> sure if, if I right. heard my name right or not. Okay. <laughs> this is a very uh, kind of spooky way of saying that. But anyway, yes. Yeah, so I am Ben for all my fans out there. Hello. Um, so, you know, Nick's always got all these <laughs> uh, interesting descriptions of his beverages. So I, I decided that I'm going to give a great description of mine as well. Uh, to continue that trend, so I have a Modelo. Um, I bought a lot of these in a box, and I still haven't gotten rid of them all, so I'm slowly working my way through them. Um, this is an aluminum can. Um, it's recyclable, so it gives a little bit of a metallic taste to it. kind of gives you that sort of element vibe, you know, the metallic elements. Um, so that's kind of interesting for the flavor design. Some people like to put it in a glass, which gives you a little bit different taste to it. Um, I keep it, though, right from the can, so a little... Um, my way or the highway, I guess, if I were to describe it in something that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And I think in, uh, yeah, you get a, a few cents for this. It says 10 cents, I think, in Oregon and Maine. So um, there you go. Some really interesting information there, Ben. Thanks for sharing. Bobby? Yeah, Benny, really, you still need to invest in some limes if you really want to improve the experience of a Modelo. Well, I'm not a follower, Bobby. I'm a leader. Okay, <laughs> but uh, so let's see if I can get this in here properly. Probably not. You can kind of see the color. So this is a Boulevard double wide IPA. It's my IPA of the day. Another another good IPA with some good character to it. So uh, I'm always a fan of trying different IPAs. It's usually, you know, with uh, I'm out or having drinks. It's usually my starter is an IPA. Um, and that kind of gets me in the right mindset. Is that a locally brewed IPA? Yes. Uh, yeah. The Boulevard is, the, yeah, the Boulevard Brewing Company in Kansas City. Yep. Right. Hey, Bob, how about you? I see um, a, a large container of pink liquid coming up to your head a few times there. Yeah. Well, um, if you had spent uh, 20 of the last 30 hours in uh, airplanes, uh, like I did, one of the things you'd be interested in today would be rehydrating because the, uh, the uh, oxygen inside the planes on a, you know, say a 13 hour flight is pretty dry. And you come out of there, you come out of there feeling like a piece of toast. Uh, and uh, so what I've got here is uh, pure rehydration uh, on the cheap, uh, say, water bottle that I refilled from the tap. I want to recommend uh, Shawnee, Kansas uh, water supply, by the way. Uh, water from the tap with um, the addition of some glorious uh, Weiler's lemonade mix powder. Um, the great thing about Weiler's is it's the, the cheapest lemonade mix powder on the market and can be found in discount stores exclusively. In, in fact, just about in discount stores. Um, but it uh, does the trick. A couple of couple of packets, and uh, you know, I've got my uh, uh, thirty three point eight fluid ounce bottle uh, ready to go, and I got you know rehydration at hand for a while, for as long as it takes me to uh, to suck this down. And it tastes actually, for my money, it's the best tasting powdered lemonade on the market, which is really odd. <laughs> Seems like you've probably got the lowest cost per ounce going tonight. Um, I, I would say it's just about a lock yeah this i mean we're uh looking at maybe 20 cents worth of investment not counting the uh, the plastic bottle wow. which i got in an airport somewhere in the world yesterday maybe it was istanbul all right um personally i don't know what i'm drinking tonight Ooh. A, <laughs> an acquaintance of mine has chosen me as one of his guinea pigs. So um, this is some sort of prototype. Um, there's any any labeling has been hidden. Uh, this came with 
a scannable barcode set of instructions and told me to take this little vial of liquid that hoping is not urine and put that into the other unknown beverage. This came with a stern warning to not drink any alcohol tonight. So there we go. I'm gonna give it a little mix. <laughs> Looks like you're struggling there, Charlie. <laughs> uh, I thought that was gonna be a bad idea. <laughs> I think it might be about to explode on him. We're gonna have to chug it. Yeah. Little, move. yeah. All right, we're good. First taste. Ah, lovely. Really nice. What does it taste like? Uh, it's pretty bland so far. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I don't think you drink. I don't think you drink it for the uh, for the taste. I'm, I'm, I don't know exactly what's going on here, but I'm guessing it's more for the experience. Wow, what a review! Okay, sounds <laughs> super cool. It's really you got that placebo funny. version. <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah, well, you monitor my. Uh, performance during the rest of the podcast yeah just remember kids out there you know remember not to buy from people's trunks outside so. <laughs> well with that um i think the uh, last set of picks that we made that have become official since our last show was uh the women's world cup um, i believe one of us picked the champion correctly which would be the second time this person has correctly chosen a champion. So I don't know who wants to recap the Women's World Cup and kind of talk about the greatness of my predictions, but uh, I'll kind of leave the floor open for you guys. Uh, well, Bob, <laughs> um, I'm uh, glad you were humble enough to bring that up. The uh, <laughs> women's final came down to uh, Britain and uh, and Spain. Uh, Australia, the host, ended up finishing fourth, losing to uh, Sweden in what was uh, uh, tantamount to the uh, to the bronze game. Um, it, uh, it it was interesting, uh, certainly at the end. And uh, England and Spain had a had a pretty good battle. the The Spanish team. Uh, Pulled off an upset, not an enormous upset, but not many people were going with Spain. So we we have to delve deeper into what gave Bobby uh, deep insights. Given the uh, level of disruption uh, on the Spanish team, not only since the tournament, <laughs> uh, but before the tournament, uh, when there was uh, something tantamount to a, a player's strike uh, just a few months ago, and uh, some players who might otherwise have been on the Spanish team uh, were not, which speaks to the depth of, uh, of their program. Uh, it, all of this would have led some to wonder if uh, Spain was coming to this uh, tournament in the, in the best frame of mind. Well, I guess they showed us something uh, there. Um, also, what Spain showed was that they have technically become really a formidable outfit. And uh, in the world of uh, uh, women's soccer, uh, moving the ball around uh, Barcelona style um, and uh, and controlling it uh, up and down the field, um, which is which is something new. And I think I mentioned after the uh, U.S. team uh, was uh, edged out of the tournament, now going back a, a few weeks ago, that a technical game was starting to emerge in the, the high end of uh, uh, women's soccer that seems to differ a little bit from what the U.S. has typically done. And the U.S. has in part gotten by on having a lot of uh, relatively good athletes um, uh, out there um, and uh, outrunning other teams. It's not, not that there's no technical skill. There's a lot of technical skill, but the, 
the level of uh, uh, intricacy uh, in working the ball around on some of the top uh, European clubs now is something I don't recall ever seeing the U.S. do. And so I think uh, the U.S. is is going to be in for uh, for a challenging time. Uh, the uh, since the rest of the world has in started investing in women's soccer a lot more and on a really high end training. Uh, it's it's gotten tougher out there. I would note now that Spain seems to be leading the world at uh, all the developmental levels at the moment. They've had champions now in uh, 17 and under and 20 and under and now the World Cup. Uh, so Spain is looking um, uh, pretty tough. Uh, and assuming they come through the latest bout of uh, uh, turmoil, one of the great unforced errors in, in sports history in the uh, championship ceremony uh, for Spain. Um, assuming they, they come out of that uh, intact, uh, their future is pretty bright. So how Bobby saw all that is uh, is beyond me. Yeah, just... As, even if you took... Divisions. Even well. if you took the USA off the board and, and had to pick, you know, Spain wouldn't have been the one that came to mind. I think two of you, I think Charlie and Nick chose uh, England uh, and uh, a perfectly logical pick uh, given the fact they you know, recently won the European <laughs> Championship. Um, some of the other teams known to be good, such as Sweden, um, you know, number of places you could go. So congratulations to Bobby and going with Spain. Um, yep. and Spain and Bobby now seem to have a relationship. Uh, that was so part of the reason I picked Spain. I was, you know, really kind of riding high off of the Alcaraz uh, victory, and it just seemed like things were going well in that country. So, uh, so continued on. So maybe most importantly, whose who's picks were the worst? I think we determined it was Benny and John. Uh-huh. It was. They both, yeah. they both had their teams knocked out relatively early. Yeah. It, was, it was John and I, yep. So, so what this can't just go by. Well, <laughs> well I mean, it, it, we, John and I talked about commenting a soccer game together. That's and, right. You were going to do that. Yes. And he's, he's always making excuses. You know, he's got, I'm yeah. traveling to Italy. I'm, I have eye surgery. You know, I can't get the guy to show up. You know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, I can't believe he ran a company. It's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he was doing, but it wasn't him that was doing the work. <laughs> so what have you done? Well, I've been waiting, you know, patiently oh. because um, this is ah. supposed to be a duo type thing. Yeah. I mean, I right. can do it by myself, but obviously uh, then John would never do it. We all know that. So Okay. Well, we'll be looking forward to that yeah. at the next meeting. Let's, you know, I'll have to let's make that a call him up, try to get him to do something. So, yeah. Well, speaking of uh, predictions... Uh, the next thing we're going to be prognosticating is the National Football League, which starts up in a couple days with the defending Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs kicking off against the Detroit Lions on Thursday night. But, uh, Charlie, do you want to take us through the NFL picks or is somebody else be better suited? Tell you what, I can, uh, why don't we just go division by division? Yeah, okay. How's that sound? Very good. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, we'll go. Youngest to oldest on each of these. Now we'll flip it around this time. Let's start with the old guys. Uh, AFC East. Bob, uh, who do you like? AFC uh, East. Let's see. Who's in the AFC East? Oh, yeah. Um, the uh, <coughs> uh, New England owned that for a long time, but now it appears the uh, the Jets may actually be poised to uh, to make a run with the, uh, the new quarterback they acquired uh, from uh, – uh, Green Bay. This is either going to be a, a great success or a great failure. Um, and uh, given the general shape of things in the AFC East, I think their timing's good. So I think the Jets have a pretty good shot. I say failure, and I, I pick the Bills. Bobby? Yeah, I'm, I'm going Buffalo Bills as well. I mean, yeah, Aaron Rodgers is a nice pickup. Dalvin Cook, nice pickup. But, uh, I mean, Buffalo Bills have Josh Allen. They're a uh, true contender, so Buffalo. Ben? Yeah. Jets are the best, most talented most team talented. in the NFL right now, okay? And they will defeat the, the Bills 
multiple times this year. I'm tired of hearing about the Bills. No, they're not going to win the division. The Jets are. And they're going to win the Super Bowl. And I would declare it now. I guarantee you, we'll win the Super Bowl. Everyone likes to watch it. I'm tired of your Dahlia Jets. I know it's been over 10 years since we made the playoffs. Okay, but guess what? This is the year. Aaron Rodgers escaped his cave. And now he's here to bring enlightenment to the rest of the NFL via Super Bowl victory. Put that in your juice box and suck it. Boom. Next Sounds year. like one of those Charles Barkley guarantees. Yeah. Yeah. Are you Are you done? Are you done? Yeah, you can go ahead. Next person. Next. All right. Um, <laughs> I predict a regression from Buffalo. Uh, they have disappointed the playoffs the last couple of years. I think the Jets will be solid. I don't expect a boomer or a bust from Rodgers. I think it'll be solid, though. It might be like 10 7, but Tua Tagovailoa has been doing um, judo this offseason, learning how to fall. I think um, I think the Dolphins, with their offense down south, will, uh, will win the AFC East. Okay, a little curveball for us there. Uh, hey, Bob, what do you think about the AFC West? AFC West. Um, Maybe I should ask the question differently. Does anybody not think the Chiefs are going to win this division? That's okay, a more appropriate that. way to frame it. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. Look, <laughs> the AFC West has been completely dominated by the Chiefs. The AFC title game, in fact, has become the Arrowhead invitation. Every year it's in Kansas City. So go ahead and mark it down. Chiefs win the division. Okay. Bob, how about the AFC South? AFC South. Um, Let's see. Uh, Yeah, what would be a a big big surprise pick in the – in the AFC South. Uh, this is probably the vision I care least about. Um, uh, we're uh, <clears throat> Would you like us to uh, come back to you? Yeah, come back to me on that. I'm okay. thinking about uh, All right, yeah. I'm going Jags. Bobby? Yeah, I'm going Jacksonville as well. Trevor Lawrence has got that team on the rise. Cool. Manny? Yeah, not a not a very good division, but um given I'm in Indianapolis, I can I can feel what's happening in the surrounding areas. I can see the the stadium from my apartment. And uh, I think Anthony Richardson is gonna bring it and uh be a a major uh Revelation for the Colts and lead them to a uh, division title this year as a rookie. Um, I think he could be a pretty good dual threat QB. Um, and um, yeah, we'll see. And you don't, you don't seem to care that the Colts are probably going to be without their best player. Eh, no one needs him. Uh, Jonathan Taylor, you know, it's okay. He's whatever. He, he hasn't just, been just as good. overrated Wisconsin running back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Wisconsin players, you know, they seem good on paper and then they don't really do much. So you get rid of them. So. Nick? All right. Um, well, I think Jackson was the best team in the division, but uh, give me Tennessee. To win the okay. Bob, uh, back to you after hearing all that. Do you uh, do you have an opinion now, or you can pass on a division too if you'd like? No, uh, I, I I think I still have to go with uh, the Jaguars and uh, Trevor right. Lawrence. Um, okay. They they looked like they were coming of age last year, and I don't think their star is going to be in the descent immediately. I, I think they're going to be around for a little while. Okay. Bob, how about the AFC North? The AFC North, uh, my heart says uh, Baltimore. My head says Cincinnati. Um, so I guess I've got to make a choice. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stick with Baltimore so that I don't have uh, co- any conflicted feelings uh, mm. when, uh, when, they, when they play. Uh, since now the, we've raised the deterrent structure uh, in these uh, predictions to the point where we may actually have to care about the uh, the correctness of our choices but uh, uh anyway i'm gonna go with baltimore i think uh they've reassembled themselves around lamar jackson uh yet again and they they look pretty good on paper All right okay you're wrong i'm gonna go with the steelers um 
Mm-hmm. He, already, he already had TJ Watt. They added two more former Badgers in Keanu Benton and Nick Her- Herbig. Um, I don't see how anybody else has a chance. Bobby? All right, so Steelers for last place. All right, so <laughs> – yeah, yeah, I got to go with the Bengals. I mean, uh, Joe Burrow's been the only – Joe Burrow and the Bengals been the only team that have really consistently given the Chiefs trouble. Um, so, yeah, got to go Cincinnati. Ben? Um, I'm going to go with the Bengals as well. Um, I think the Ravens are kind of a team that's going to be struggling for a while. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really confident in the Lamar Jackson era. I've never really been all that confident. I know Lamar Jackson's super talented, but um, – you know, I think he's a guy that kind of depended a little bit too much on on running early on in his career. And um, I think that kind of is going to you know come back to bite him over time. I just don't see the Ravens being super successful um, with him. Cool. Give me give me Cincinnati. I think they're going to get the one seed in the SC and win the division as well. OK. Moving on to the NFC, Bob, at NFC East. Who do you like? Uh, nobody actually, but uh, the uh, I I let's uh, do something odd. Let's pick the New York Giants. Uh, hmm. They actually showed some signs of, uh, of coming together. The quarterback situation is stable. Uh, so um, the, the Giants tend to sneak up and, and win uh, in kind of a stealth maneuver. I mean, you think back to their, their Super Bowl victories, and, you know, the one against the undefeated uh, Patriots team, and for example. And so, but these, these Giant teams don't catch your eye um, at the beginning. There's something fairly unspectacular about them, uh, but they – when they're good, they're well constructed and they get it done. Good defense, efficient uh, offense. Okay, <clears throat> I must say, I, I I do sense you're you're pulling your predictions a little more out of thin air than normal. That said, I'm going to go with the Eagles. Bobby, yeah, I'm going with Philly as well. Uh, Eli Manning is no longer playing for the Giants, so I don't see them making any sort of miraculous run. Um, it's uh, Eagles looking pretty tough. They got a lot, lot of talent. So I'd be real, real surprised if they don't take it. And, uh, yep, I'm going with the Eagles as well. And Nick, and I will as well. Okay. Uh, well, well he's there, Charlie. The, uh, huh? Huh? Well, I mean, okay. You, Charlie's the one who likes, you know, deeply thought out hunch picks that uh, go against <laughs> the curve. So. Um, I'm I'm delivering this week for you, Charlie. I just don't think they're that well thought out. They're, I, think, I think you're just kind of Ooh, brother versus I, brother. I think you're kind of pulling these out of your, you know what? Oh. I think you sound like a guy who's spent too much time in Uzbekistan. But anyway, <laughs> AFC West, NFC West, <laughs> NFC West. Um, I like the 49ers. Ditto, Bobby. Yeah, I like San Francisco as well. They have uh, some quarterback play that's been pretty good recently. And, uh, yeah, they've been pretty solid for a few years now. So I'll go with them. Ben? Uh, I'm going to go with the Cardinals. Whoa. Huh. Yep. Did not the, Cardinal, the Cardinals might be the worst team in the, in the league. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> I mean, is Kyler Murray, Murray even going to be playing? Wow. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Hot take, Bobby. Get <laughs> ready. Where the hell is this coming from? Just watch out. You saw oh, it wow. here. You saw it here first. I mean, the Cardinals, Cardinals could end up with the top two picks in the next draft. They don't need them. If they do, I mean, they don't need them. They're going to okay. watch. He's why Cardinals. <laughs> Boom shakalaka. Give me the 49ers. Yeah. We, we're going to need to figure out the punishment for uh, yeah, that's for that bad pick. I think Benny's in trouble. <laughs> I mean, I would say there ought to be a specific punishment if your team finishes last in the division. There's some something bad has got to happen. Wow. That said, moving on. Start, NFC. Start looking up your uh, punishment, Charlie. NFC South. Bob. NFC. Who's in the NFC South anyway? <laughs> so you got the Saints, the Bucks, the Falcons, and the Panthers. Yeah. Um. If. 
this um, maybe above all the divisions invites uh, uh, a wild guess. Um, Would you rather go last on these picks, Bob? No, that's okay. That's okay. I I I I am perfectly comfortable setting trends. Um, we'll go with the uh, the Saints for no particular reason. Okay, I like your pick. I'm going Saints also. I'm going Bob. with the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. This was really a toss up for me. Um, but uh, Tampa Bay has a couple former Gophers on the team. Uh, so, and Baker Mayfield, I think, you know, may have a little bit of a bounce back. So I'll go with Tampa. Oof. Okay, Ben. I'm also going with Tampa. Um, Vision is crapshoot, but Buccaneers, I mean, they brought in a lot of talent around the Brady years. So those guys are still sticking around a little bit. Those guys are also pretty old. Um, I'll take the Saints. <laughs> and last and possibly least, NSC North, Bob. Interesting. Got Interesting. another crapshoot here. Um, I'm uh, going to go against uh, my normal trends. I'm going to go with uh, with Green Bay. Everything is set up for Green Bay to be maybe a, a hair overlooked. Um, and uh, that's why they'll do just uh, just fine. There's uh, no uh, e emotion here. I'm not a Packers fan. Um, and uh, But I they figure they got as good a, good a shot as anyone. Okay. At risk of uh, causing a little internal conflict in my own life, I'm going to go with the Vikings. Bobby. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the Packers are on the demise. I think uh, the Vikings are going to regress. Um, I think losing Dalvin Cook is, is going to hurt a little bit. And Kirk Cousins, you know, he's a solid quarterback, but he's not somebody who's going to win you a title, I don't think. Um, I like the Detroit Lions. They're, they seem to be on the rise. Got a good coach that seems to have that team in the right mindset. Uh, so I like Detroit to finally make some noise. Okay. So um, I'm going to go with the Bears. Um, I think Justin Fields is on the rise. He had a good finish last season, and I think he's going to win the division. So. Oh, okay. I think you're the tiebreaker, Nick. <laughs> I mean, I think anybody can win the division. I'll be <laughs> I see 10 and 7 winning it. Um, I think Detroit is not going to ascend as much as people think. I don't think Minnesota is going to regress as much as people think. I think Green Bay will be kind of in the middle. I think I think Minnesota wins it. Yeah. Yep. That's the right choice. Detroit just can't win. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's like it's, it's a gravity thing. I can't. can't yep. <clears throat> Who's, uh, who is going to be this year's uh, – Cinderella team. Does that uh, are we are we putting any qualifiers on this? Do we like not? I think it's more of a feel thing. Okay. So is this is a, a team that makes a playoff run essentially? Yeah. Or however you want to define Cinderella is in a lot of shapes and forms. Somebody's gonna surprise. Jets are in the Super Bowl. That would be that would be a, a shock. Okay. After dissing the Lions, I'm going to go Lions. I like the, uh, the Giants. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a division winner that you pick, I suppose. It could just be. This, right. And this is more, this is going to be a little subjective. Um, this is kind of a totally separate I'm thing. kind of the czar of the predictions. I will be the yeah. committee to determine. Okay. Well, I think because the, the NFC pick. South. I think because the NFC South is so shaky, um, anything can happen. I think a team like the Carolina Panthers could come out of nowhere and make, right. make a run, make the playoffs, and do some damage. Okay. Any other thoughts on a Cinderella? Yeah, um, I think I'm going to take a cue from uh, Charlie on this one. I, I think uh, the Steelers, who could well finish last, in their division 
could be a second place team in the division if things fall into place and maybe mature enough come playoff time that they could be scary. Ah. I like it. Super Bowl champion, we already know Ben is picking the Jets. Who is not picking the Chiefs? I'll take I'll take Cincinnati, I think. Okay. I think they put it together this year. I'm going Chiefs. Yep. Back to back. Dynast Dynasty is well underway. Yep. Chiefs are well set up. I mean, it's Reed has done a terrific job with this organization. And of course, selecting, you know, Pat Mahomes a few years ago was a stroke of genius, and it's all paying off. Okay. There we have our 2023-24 NFL predictions. Bobby, back to you. Ooh, I got something to say. <laughs> you already we already heard you. That's okay. I'll I'll, I'll come back. No, we we know we yeah uh, we know what you're <laughs> my fans want to hear me speak, Charlie. Listen. That's a, do your own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I'll, I I, just, I hope my I hope my followers don't attack you for that comment, Charlie. <laughs> All right. Anyways, I did want to go over the uh, all time stats um, that we have for predictions real quickly, given we've had a few uh, things happen. Um, so still, so instead of doing percentage, because it's hard to keep track of for people, um, I just to do whoever's leading in terms of most correct predictions. Cause we predict, we make predictions on all sorts of things. So, um, in first place still with 16 correct predictions is my dad, Bob. Um, so he's got 16, but tied for first is also Charlie with 16. Bobby, though, is closing in after back-to-back -back, uh, correct picks. Bobby's at 14. Then we have Nick at 12. We have uh, consistently missing John at 10. And then we have myself at 9, which um, is soon to change. So stay tuned. But anyway, that's what we got. Now, as far as events go, where there's multiple participants and you're picking one champion... I believe I've done that correctly twice. And I don't think anybody else has done it. You're saying where, where you're, I, where think, you're, I think Bobby's starting right. At the I, beginning before a tournament starts picking the champion. Yeah. I've done it twice. So that yeah. could be that's that great. Be. So, really, yeah. that's pretty cool. That's not bad as a tiebreaker. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's awesome. Yeah. Happy but, for you. So now that we have all that out of the way. By the uh, way, I have been, I just want to let you guys, I mean, the whole punishment thing, I just want to let you guys know I am continuing to follow through. Mm -hmm. So with my grass. I was, I was going to ask, yeah. Yes, remember, you were all there for the birth. Yeah. For conception, I guess it was actually, actually not the birth. Have you seen it since that? No, no. No, one's, no one's seen your grass. In a few I think I missed probably. our last podcast. As of our yeah. last podcast, it actually looked really good and healthy. And then uh, I was gone a little bit recently and I actually kind of forgot about it and forgot. Wow. To... That explains a lot. <laughs> so it doesn't look as good as it <laughs> did. <laughs> <laughs> but it's there. Someone called child, okay. child services there. Oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think it's like it's, um, wow. it, you know, grass can go dormant. I think this is dormant. Mm -hmm. like, I think you're I right. Gave yeah. it I did give it water today. Yeah. So. I mean, I, there's a, a few flecks of green still visible. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, it is really skinny. It's like you those news know. stories you hear about about the kid locked in a closet or something. It's <laughs> this, would be, this would be the equivalent. <laughs> yeah, it looked, it was so cool a little while ago, but. Oh, oh. Well. well, you didn't follow through on drinking your Guinness, Charlie. So you botched that one. Huh? You, you skipped that punishment. You acted like you're doing all your punishments. You skipped that one. I was there. I'll do it. I got no problem with that one. Yeah, I <laughs> as, as punishments go, that one's pretty rough, huh, Charlie? Yeah. <laughs> this is the only one that entails an ongoing responsibility. So I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Parenting is tough. Yeah. It is. Thought I was done with all that. <laughs> Pretty impressive stuff. So, uh, so, Dad, did you pick up any interesting insights in the world of sports while you're in Central Asia? Uh, well, I uh, the first leg of my return, uh, I was on board the plane with the uh, Uzbek national team uh, on their uh, journey to the United States to uh, play against Team USA this coming weekend uh, in a friendly. Um, Uzbekistan is probably not going to be playing in the uh, World Cup tournament. You never know, they might qualify. Uh, they're, they're getting better, but it's a long journey. Um, and uh, we'll get some glimpse of where they stand when they play against the United States. Not that we know exactly where the United States stands, but the United States is looking pretty, uh, pretty ready to go for uh, its World Cup appearance. Uh, not so far down the road anymore. Uh, we've talked about this before, the, the talent uh, that the U.S. has um, and the uh, the overall skill level is best in uh, in memory, uh, probably the best ever for the United States. Uh, so uh, I'll be surprised if the U.S. struggles in uh, the game this uh, this coming weekend. If, uh, if Uzbekistan stays within three goals and scores, uh, I think it'll be a successful trip. Very good. So moving on to uh, our sports updates or anything that's happening in the world of athletics that has caught our eye recently. Uh, Nick, what do you have? We can talk about it every week, but Stanford and Cal officially gone to sign their bids to ACC. Well, I think they're getting something like 30% the revenue that all other teams in the league are getting. No? Is it? Is that wrong? Are you right? I think that's correct. Oh, I thought you were shaking your head. Um, I'm shaking my head because it, it's mind blowing. Well, they, they were in a pickle, <laughs> that's for sure. I, yeah. I think if you're in a team or a league of four, you, you don't have a lot of leverage. Um, so they're going to DCC, um, getting 30%. Um, yeah, the the revenue of all their ACC schools. I don't know if, I don't know if they pay for travel, but uh, financially, uh, it's between travel. Um, cannot be a good situation so yeah interesting what a mess yeah it's all over the place now and, and we're now we're down to two teams in the pac-12 um so we'll see if the pac-12 just dissolves or just becomes the tupac conference yeah simple be simplify scheduling a little bit yeah <laughs> I, think, I think one of the mountain west what is it, Washington that, State? That Washington? sounds like the most likely scenario. However, I think I, I, I heard recently that the Pac-12 still technically has a deal with the NCAA tournament for basketball, mm -hmm. and the Pac-12 will still get a lot of money from that as long as, long as they're called the Pac-12. So mm -hmm. if they just add some teams to the Pac-12, those schools would get the Pac-12 money from the NCAA wow. tournament, which oh, might be enough to – incentivize some Mountain West teams to go there instead. Uh, who knows? It's crazy. I wonder what it sounds like. Maybe you could buy the Pac-12. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, that's an idea. Uh, so, Benny, what do you have? Yeah, so um, looking at the, the world of soccer, um, so right now, you know, there's been two major headlines in soccer besides, you know, all the, the top five major leagues starting up again across Europe. Um, there's also been the Saudi Pro League and the MLS. Uh, Saudi Pro League has made uh, a bunch of humongous signings in this transfer window, which have been, you know, pretty much out of this world. Um, you got four government funded teams that have essentially an endless supply of money. So, you know, they've brought in uh, Neymar. Uh, Kareem Benzema and Cristiano Ronaldo this transfer window, which for people who don't watch soccer, that's like the equivalent of bringing in Steph Curry, Joel Embiid, and Kevin Durant into the Saudi Basketball League. I mean, it's completely ridiculous. Um, and you got four major teams with endless supply of money. Then you got like everyone else that barely has a stadium. And, you know, like they're showing some, you know, superstar soccer players sitting in like folding chairs in their locker room 
with like, you know, wallpaper falling off and stuff. It's just crazy. So um, there's not much parity in the league, but they, those four teams can basically buy anyone they want. It seems like um, in terms of the MLS, uh, Messi continues to dominate. I mean, he won the league's cup between uh, Mexican teams and uh, MLS teams. And uh, with inner Miami, he's still undefeated just a few days ago. Uh, he beat with inner Miami LAFC, which is defending MLS champions three to one in LA with a ton of different celebrities there. Like Leonardo DiCaprio, Prince Harry was there. Um, Selena Gomez, you know, all sorts of A-listers. And um, yeah, I mean, Messi is just changing soccer in the U S it's pretty unbelievable. And people now think that inner Miami is a serious contender to not only make the playoffs, but potentially, you know, win the MLS cup, um, which would be pretty insane. But um, given everything happening so far, it's pretty ridiculous, but we'll see what happens. Uh, their next game is actually gonna be this weekend against uh, interestingly enough, sporting Kansas city. So my hometown team, Though Messi's not going to be there because he's going to be uh, playing a, a game for Argentina. Um, so maybe Sporting KC can pull that one out then. And uh, <laughs> in the win winning streak or the, the non-losing streak, I should say, since they did tie once recently. But yeah, so far in the MLS, the only team that seems to be close to being able to touch uh, Inter Miami is Nashville, interesting enough, who has the reigning MVP in Hani Mukhtar. Um, so, but yeah, we'll see how things continue to develop there. Hey Ben, what's what are, what are the Saudis plan paying those guys? You know, um, it's ridiculous amounts. Um, we're we're looking at figures of like over a hundred million a year, yeah. um, for for players. So basically, every I think Neymar, Benzema, and Cristiano Ronaldo are like the top three, uh, in terms of pay in the entire world now. So I mean, they're not really consistently getting guys that are you know in the prime of their careers. Most of those guys want to stay in the competitive leagues. Um, and, and still people would not rank Saudi pro league over like the MLS or anything just because, you know, four teams have lots of star power. Um, but there's zero development in Saudi Arabia in terms of soccer talent. I mean, they have some good players in Saudi Arabia, but the, the league as a whole is pretty lacking when it comes to talent and developed talent and not, guys are not currently moving there early on in their career. So what that league looks like 10 years from now is hard to say. Um, they're able to buy in lots of players, but if you can't develop the talent to maintain a league and, um, you know, continue to get attendance uh, figures up, because right now the attendance of Saudi Arabia league is not great. I mean, if you have that four, those four teams are doing pretty well, but overall, I mean, the league has lots of infrastructure issues and not a ton of fan support. Um, so We'll see what happens, but they're certainly making it interesting with all the talent they're bringing in. Yeah, it's been uh, real interesting, yeah, especially with the MLS and uh, Messi, yeah, continuing to impress. Really, they've only been uh, held scoreless once, but other than that, Messi's been – Messi's found a way to have a magical impact on every single game. It's pretty amazing. But uh, Charlie. What do you have for us? Anything? Uh, the Ryder Cup. Um, oh, yeah. It's going to be played in Italy at the end of this month. And the uh, recent development of interest was the naming of the team. Uh, there's 12 players on the U.S. team. Six are automatic qualifiers based on a uh, point system over the two years since the last Ryder Cup. So what's always interesting is to see how uh, the captain, in this case, Zach Johnson, fills out the team. Um, if there was a theme to what he did, I think he was really focused on, um, I guess, kind of a locker room, kind of locker room chemistry. Um, best examples of that would be uh, Ricky Fowler, who was kind of a, I would say, a borderline pick based on his um, performance. He has had a good year. Um, he, he probably would have been 10th or 12th best player anyway, but he's got a lousy match play record in the, in the Ryder Cup uh, at three, seven, and five. But uh, Johnson chose him anyway, and I think a lot of that's because he is he's a really, really, really popular player, not just among fans, but among um, his uh, playing counterparts as well. 
Another interesting choice was Justin Thomas, who by his standards has had a terrible year. He did not even make the FedEx Cup playoffs, which invites go to the top 70 players on the tour. He was he just missed the top 70. Um, but Thomas is a good friend of some of the automatic qualifiers, and he does have a good match play record. He's uh, 16, 5, and 3. He brings um, a lot of emotion and firepower to the team. So that was an interesting choice. And I would say another interesting choice, not a big surprise, was uh, Brooks Kepka. Um, clearly, he's good enough to make the team. The only thing that made it interesting was that he was the one live player chosen uh, for the U.S. team. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. I, I, I think overall it's not, it's not as good a team as the U.S. has certainly had two years ago. Um, they are slightly favored, the U.S. is against the European team. However, I'd, if I had to pick right now, I'd probably pick the Europeans. They seem to have a lot of – they've got a few players that are really in in top form, um, especially Victor Hovland, who, who did who, – who ran away with the uh, FedEx Cup with some unbelievable uh, golf the last uh, last couple of tournaments. Very good. Yeah, Ryder Cup, always an interesting tournament. Um, it's fun to have international play involved. Um, but, uh, yeah, how about you? Uh, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, folks don't, uh, pay a great deal of attention to, uh, women's, uh, collegiate rugby, um, possibly because there are only 11 schools <laughs> in NCAA, uh, division one, uh, women's rugby. Uh, among whom Dartmouth uh, is year to year the uh, the premier team, and figured to be uh, uh, to be again. Um, I think we need to get out a word about baseball. Of course, there's a little bit uh, above the regular season yet to be played, but my uh, call for the Orioles winning the division is looking good today. Um, and I think the Orioles story at the end of the year is going to be a pretty remarkable one uh, to tell, um, which is no guarantee that they're going to make a deep playoff run, but they could. Um, and I think we'll have to think about our World Series picks here in the not-too-distant future. But before the playoffs begin, uh, in uh, in any case, it, uh, it looks like a pretty wild finish could be in order for uh, for baseball. Yeah, that'll be uh, fun to watch down the stretch. Uh, a lot of interesting storylines. Um, some of our picks are looking pretty good. Some of them are looking pretty terrible uh, right now. So um, one that comes to mind, at least for me, is LA Angels sure aren't winning the division. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to, to watch these last few weeks. But um, the Angels are things. owners of one of the worst executive decisions made in, uh, in recent sports when they had to go either all in or all out on uh, uh, Atani, uh, they decided to go all in and bought more players and so on and so forth. And now it's a train wreck. Uh, yeah, they went all in and now they're putting guys, and then they put a bunch of guys on waivers and it's just going to end up as a total loss. So uh, I have a feeling Otani is going to be looking for a way out. Um, but a uh, couple quick things. I have one uh, pretty amazing story out of Formula One racing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Max Verstappen has won 10 consecutive races, which is an F1 record, which I'm having a hard time, hard time even wrapping my head around how that's even possible to win 10 straight races of any sort. I mean, that, like, I'm not sure what would, it would, it would be harder to win 10 straight races or 10 straight golf tournaments or, or, I mean, it's just yeah, mind blowing to me to think that's even a possibility with anything, everything that can go wrong in a race. Um, so, uh, yeah, clearly looking at one of the greatest racers in the history of this, um, that's pretty amazing stuff. And we'll see how long it lasts. Um, but uh, also with, you know, college football has certainly, certainly been a theme today. I was looking up the uh, bowl game schedule for this year, which is always, seems like it's getting more and more ridiculous, the number of bowl games we have. Uh, we're scheduled for 43 bowl games this year, which means 86 Division One football teams are going to get to play in a bowl game. So maybe Northwestern could still do it. 
I mean, you might have teams finishing with losing records that get into bowl games because how are you going to fill all those spots? I mean, they're going to. And what is there like 120 some? Yeah, about 120 odd, 125 or so maybe schools now at this point. They may have to reach down to Ivy League or D3, send out some invites, fill out fill out all those games. (laughs) Yeah. And I can reach so, that. So, yeah, it's going to be pretty uh, some pretty cool sounding games too. So uh, I was looking at, at some of the names of some of these games. We have the Scooters Coffee Frisco Bowl. That should be a good one. The Pop Tarts Bowl, sure to be a classic. And then the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl. So lots of stuff to really shoot for the stars for, and uh, see if you can get in one of those marquee bowl games and get all kinds of free cereal and breakfast swag. That's going to be great. But anyway, with all that, thanks for listening in and watching to episode 12 of Sports Talk, The Generation Gap. Till next time, have a good one.